I have bangs. I got bangs. What? <laughs> Who is she? She's got bangs. So, hi. If you're new here, I, I recently got bangs, in case you didn't hear that. Um, my name is August. I hope you're all doing really, really well. I am so excited that you're here with me today. And we're going to talk about some really awesome books that I read in the month of February. So if you have been watching some of my previous videos, you might see that things look a little different right now. And that's because we have this brand new bookshelf here. It has this wonderful long desk. Lots of room. It goes all the way up to the ceiling. I love it. I love it so much. So welcome to another new little book nook. I am so excited and happy for it and good things. Good things. I want to share with you all the wonderful reads that I read this month in the month of February 2021. I read a grand total of 12 books and I have some statistics to share with you all. Cheers, friends. Let's let's hop right into it. So in February, like I said, I read a total of 12 books. I read 2,354 pages, um, which is less than what I read last month in January. Uh, genres. I read one short story collection, two graphic slash illustrated novels, three literary fictions, one contemporary. Why do I keep counting four? <laughs> one contemporary, one horror, one thriller, one mystery, and two young adult novels. I have the following ratings. I had three five-star reads. I had five four-star reads. I had one three-star read, one two-star read, and two books that I did not give any ratings for. So overall, it was a pretty good reading month. In the month of February, I did a random genre generator. Uh, so I was able to conclude that in February, which was really exciting. But now I am starting a color wheel generator. So it's all these really fun colors. And then what it lands on is the color of the book I have to pick out. Okay, so the first book that I read in the month of February was Awayland by Ramona Asabel. This is a collection of really wonderful little short stories. I found this copy over at Dollar Tree and I freaking love this cover so much. These short stories are really sensory and they really transport you to these different places and times and cities all over the world and some of them have kind of like a magical realism element and the writing in here is just really atmospheric, very sensory focused and very soft and I really enjoyed it. Some of my favorite stories in here included one called Remedy and it was all about this hand transplant um, between lovers. Uh, this woman was convinced that she was gonna die so she asked her partner like hey before I die can we like swap hands and I thought it was just such an interesting topic um, in order to become like really close to each other and share each other's blood and DNA so I thought it was really fascinating and such an interesting concept. Another short story I loved in here was called The Animal Mummies Wish to Thank the Following and it was all written from the perspective of these animals that have been taxidermed and have been put on display in museums um, and it was just so quirky and fun but it's one that stuck with me when I went to go actually visit a museum I immediately thought of that story and thought about all the things that they've seen and been through and how they've been preserved. It was just such a fun quirky story. The last story in here really took me by surprise and kind of elevated the rest of the book I think from like a three star into like a four star which is ultimately what I gave this book was four out of five and it followed this uh, shipwreck that happened kind of I'm assuming in the maybe 1800s. There's a shipwreck and these three men get washed ashore on this deserted island that's just completely covered in snow and ice like it's completely desolate and all of a sudden a mermaid just shows up on shore and it deals with how the three men interpret this mermaid. One wants to see it as a lover. I think there are definitely some trigger warnings for that story in particular just at the very end there. Um, one where the yeah the man sees the mermaid as like a lover, as something, as an object basically. One sees it as his wife where he just wants to take care of her and love her and nurture her and grow old with her. And then the other man views her as his daughter and wants to make sure she's safe and provide for her and you know, that kind of stuff. So overall, I really enjoyed this short story collection. I don't read a lot of short story collections, so this was a really wonderful one and I really do recommend it if you like 
kind of slightly magical realism, very human element stories that just follow people's lives. The one thing I think that linked all of these stories together into one piece is the sense of human longing. Us as humans, we're always kind of longing and like the grass is greener on the other side and if we just push through we can get to something better, bigger, whatever. And this book, like each short story just kind of felt like the end of the movie, like The Graduate, where it's like once you attain what you wanted, there's still so much uncertainty and us as humans we just like oh if I just get here I'll be fine if I just <laughs> so I really liked that human aspect in these stories I thought it was a really wonderful collection of short stories so there is a wayland the next book I had the absolute pleasure of reading was <clears throat> the tea dragon society by Katie O'Neill this is the most wholesome sweetest graphic novel I've ever read look at those colors and oh I love it and there was so much wonderful representation in this book there was just so many whimsical elements I absolutely loved this it was so much fun to read but basically it follows this kind of magical realm where in it there are these little rare dragons that sprout little herbs for tea on their heads and then there's this whole lost art of cultivating those herbs and learning how to care for a tea dragon and in the back of this copy it actually goes over all the different dragons and how to best care for them so there's jasmine tea dragon chamomile tea dragon ginseng like they all have such quirky little personalities and it's just learning how to take care of them and their needs in order for them to thrive and then grow and it was just so cute and i can't wait to read the rest in the series if you're just looking for a really wholesome sweet book to read for any age highly highly recommend this one five stars this was the first five star of february and it was great. <laughs> Next I read an ebook called Come Madre by Roque Leracuay and this was translated from Spanish and wow. This is a horror novel. This book is split into two different stories, kind of almost down the middle a little bit. Uh, the first story takes place in 1907 in a sanatorium in Buenos Aires. We're following this doctor named Dr. Quintana and um, he works at the sanatorium but the overhead like chief of the sanatorium comes in one day and says like hey i want to perform a scientific experiment to see if the human brain and vocal cords can survive after being decapitated after being beheaded um so the story disgustingly horrifyingly follows these poor patients who are then subjected to getting their heads cut off in this device that they make where it doesn't sever the vocal cords and then it describes what these heads that are their bodies like fall into like a trapdoor basement and then the heads talk after they're dead um, in order for them to prove this scientific experiment and get into medical journals and <laughs> so gross, so disturbing. The mental images were really nasty. Um, it really did give me the heebie-jeebies. And then the second story is modern day and it talks about this pretty popular artist who was kind of like a child genius when it came to the art world and painting. And he sets up this art installation that includes a lot of body horror and it includes amputation. So this is a book that's definitely body horror based. While I enjoyed the the concept and the story and the horror of it, it didn't scare me as much as I kind of wanted it to. It didn't make me feel as icky as I wanted it to, which sounds messed up because it does, it's a, it's a gross concept, it's a gross topic, but the writing itself, like it and especially in the first story it followed Dr. Quintana as he's like pursuing this nurse and he's like really freakishly in love with her and is really kind of obsessed with her and there are a lot of like different metaphors and images that appear in that first story that become repetitive motifs throughout and I personally just didn't feel like I understood the full meaning and I, I wish I had a little bit more insight. I wish I knew a little bit more about what this author was trying to say because I don't think I picked it up. Overall, I gave this book three stars. I thought it was a really enjoyable read, but one that um, it didn't fully leave me satisfied. When I ended it, it was just kind of like, oh, 
okay. Um, I wanted a little bit more from this book, but overall I did enjoy it, and I, I'm actually really excited to keep reading some maybe like more translated horror books. This was, I think, one of my first that's been translated in the horror genre that I've read, and I really enjoyed it. Um, this is this author's first book to be published in English, so I will definitely be on the lookout to see if more are translated in the future. Next book I picked up was The Rose Variations by Marisha Chamberlain. I found this book at a used bookstore, and it is actually the ARC copy. I chatted about this quite a bit in one of my vlogs, which I'll be linking down below for you all. This book follows this one woman named named Rose in the 1970s and it follows her as she enters this new position at a small liberal arts college in Minnesota and she is the first and only female composer and professor and uh, it just kind of follows her mishaps and her life and her misadventures. This is a book that if you like the writing style of Donna Tartt I highly recommend this one just because it was a whole like exhibit of this one woman's life and so much detail and beautiful prose. It was so lyrical and atmospheric and really, really gorgeous. Um, this just follows her as she falls in and out of love and as she falls in and out of friendships and relationships, family situations. Um, but throughout it is just this lyrical feeling of being a musician and hearing music through each part of the life and how it might sound as one movement. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. I really, really did enjoy it. Towards the end though, I was getting a little frustrated with Rose because I feel like she was making decisions that really made me angry and I was like, okay, like let's get on with it. I felt like the book could have ended a little bit sooner than when it did, but overall, like I think I even highlighted and annotated the like second to last paragraph because even that like throughout it it still had such beautiful language and I really loved um, this author's writing style so overall I gave this book four stars it didn't f it wasn't like a full s five star wow experience for me I would definitely be open to reading more from Marisha Chamberlain so that is the Rose Variations. Next on my list I read the Vagina Monologues by Eve Ensler. This is something that I would have absolutely loved to see performed live someday. There were definitely a lot of trigger warnings because it does talk about sexual violence against women. There were just so many women in this that were interviewed about their vaginas. I thought it was just such a wonderful movement um, when this kind of came out and discussing this anatomy that I feel like is really... <laughs> People don't like to say the word. We don't like to say the word vagina. And like, it's it just talks about that, how it is this like shunned thing. We have all these like weird words for it instead of what it is. It's just so amazing that Eve Ensler interviewed so many women and was able to retell their stories, um, how some of them have been just taught to be so ashamed of their bodies, whereas others are going through the process of learning to love it and like the difference in the language we use um, as we're going through that evolution of learning to love our bodies. It's just profound. You can see it in the vocabulary. You can see it in the language between women who have been completely violated because of their bodies. Um, and because of how they were born, the gender they were given at birth, and I really enjoyed it. So I gave this book four out of five stars, and I think it's definitely a wonderful piece of like feminist literature, and yeah, I highly recommend it. I then picked up Any Man by Amber Tamblyn. Who? <laughs> wow, this book was good! This book was good! This one definitely has trigger warnings uh, for rape, sexual abuse, sexual assault, same as the vagina monologue, so please be careful going into it. But um, this book follows four or five, I believe, different men who have all been raped by the same woman. And this is a serial rapist who's a female named Maud. It is just like a time capsule for 2017 to like maybe like 2019. There is a lot of references to the world at that time. Um, there are, it's almost like a mixed media. In here there are like emails back and forth, there are internet chats, there's search histories in here, um, and there's like tweets as well, and the tweets are from our old uh, president, whose name I will not say. It's very reminiscent of a very specific time in our history, and I think Amber Tamblyn did a fantastic job of writing dialogue, making this feel so real. I have, I don't think I remember the last time I've read an author whose dialogue was so 
uh, incredible where when reading it you could actually hear the voices in your head you could hear these characters voices as if they're actors in a movie like it was just so well done she's an incredibly talented author um, but this book just explores themes that women have gone through for maybe all of history of being completely defiled and people not taking them seriously, victim blaming, victim shaming. Um, there are female uh, news anchors who go over this story saying like, well, what were they wearing? Well, you know, can men really be raped? And yes, they can, but this just kind of does the exact same thing. It's just role reversal where instead of women being the victim and there's a serial rapist, it's just vice versa where the sexes have swapped. Uh, overall, this was really jarring to read. I think it was incredibly well done. It was really psychologically messed up, but you're just so immersed in that world because there's so much to do with social media and current day kind of like pop culture references in here as well. So I think it's just fantastic read. I highly recommend it. I I really liked it, but again, I wouldn't recommend it to absolutely everybody. Uh, this is definitely a very sensitive subject. So that is Any Man by Amber Tamblyn. I gave this four and a half stars, but on Goodreads, I just put four stars, but overall, I really, really did like it. Next, I read a book with my partner. This was a book that um, had just been sitting on my nightstand for a very, very long time, and I was like, hey, let's, let's read this together. And that was The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse by Charlie Mackesy. This is a really gorgeous illustration almost like a modern day kind of like Winnie the Pooh full of these beautiful motivational quotes. This just follows, yeah, a boy, a mole, a fox, and a horse as they discuss life and self-esteem and love, connection, family, journeys, adventures, home, the meaning of home. It was very profound. It was very good in this little book. This just includes a lot of messages that I think we all should be still hearing every day of our life. We should still be hearing like, it's okay to make mistakes. I ended up not giving this book a rating on Goodreads just because like, yes, it was enjoyable, but I don't feel like I have any words to critique it. So if I can't critique it, then I don't think I should be rating it. Does that make sense? That is this book. Okay, friends, this next one I, oh. <laughs> I hated this next one. This was the only two star rating that I gave in 2021 so far. This was my least favorite book of 2021. <laughs> I'm ready to talk about it. Let's talk about it. My two star read was Death in St. Petersburg by Tasha Alexander. This is a book that I found while thrifting. I looked it up, found out it was like number 12 in this series called the Lady Emily series. I was like, okay, let's do some research. Can I read them out of order? Sure, go ahead, read them out of order. Sweet, I'll do it. I read it uh, because my random generator landed on mystery. This is Lady Emily mystery series. <laughs> I hated it. I hated it so much. It made me so mad. The premise was so cool. And then like, I hated it. This book bounces between like 1889 and 1901. And Lady Emily is visiting St. Petersburg in Russia. They just saw a performance of Swan Lake at the famous Marinsky Theater. When they all leave the theater, they find that the, one of the prima ballerinas has been slain in the snow. And that's how we open up. So of course I'm intrigued. I'm like, wow, I like these vibes. But then things unfold and things happen and I'm just like, but why? Why? So first off, I, I tried to take things with a little bit of a grain of salt because I am jumping into a series not the start. Maybe there's a little bit more backstory as to why we like Lady Emily. Why is she a lady in the first place? Her husband is kind of like this man who kind of watches over politics? I don't know. But then all of a sudden this like prince shows up and it's just like Lady Emily I need your help but like she's not actually from St. Petersburg she's not from Russia I don't get why she's now deemed like real investigators are investigating this like why why her why what does she <laughs> I don't get it but this prince is like I've been having an affair with this prima ballerina who just died I'm really upset about it I don't trust the government or the local officials to like figure out who killed her I'm can you can you look into it for me I trust you I'm like, wow, dude, you're putting your trust into somebody that you don't even know. So we go into it and Lady Emily is just the worst 
character I have ever read. She is so pretentious. She is this like air of like aristocracy and like she's so much more superior than everyone else but she's also like very beautiful and regal but like also like hella smart. There are just all these little like anecdotes about how she read Greek. I, I can't quite describe exactly what I mean unless you read it then you'll know because we all know people in real life who do that who like just drop nuggets in like different languages and then you're like what does that mean but they don't explain it unless you ask what does that mean oh i don't i don't like that and uh this author tasha alexander did leave russian words in here without even giving you any clues as to what they meant sometimes you can just assume if you see a word in a different language you can be like oh well based on the sentence it probably means this Nope, you can't guess what these Russian words mean at all. So I just went through the book being like, wow, okay, thanks for gatekeeping me, I guess. My biggest qualm that I had with this book, though, is that she didn't actually do any detective work. She just happens to be in the right place at the right time every time. Every time. Every time something happens, she's just right there. Um, she didn't do any sleuthing, but basically she would just, like, follow people and then, like, listen in on their conversations and then this writing <laughs> these characters who are the bad guys or whatever are just having full-on conversations about their entire plots a to b of like we're gonna do this and then we're gonna attack that guy and then but how would we know about that oh well we sent that secret letter like just i'm like you don't <laughs> She didn't do any discovering. She didn't do any sleuthing. Like, it was literally, like, people just, like, said everything. It felt like a Scooby-Doo episode, but, like, worse. And even the ending, I was laughing out loud because of the, the dialogue was ridiculous. The story was horrendous. I hated it so much. I think two stars, honestly, is very nice because I hated it so much and I will hate it forever and I can't wait until this wrap up is done and I can get rid of this book. Ow, oh, I hated it. Okay, on to something a little bit fluffier because at this point I really wanted something fluffier. We went through a lot of books that had a lot of dense topics, especially regarding the culture of violence against women. I was like, I need something good here in my life. I need something good. And that happened to be Girls Dinner Club by Jesse Elliott. I took off the dust jacket because it was from the library and it had like sticky stuff all over it. Ugh, I did not like it. So I apologize. Um, maybe I can hold it like this so you can see the cover. Um, it is nicely embossed here, but yeah, Girls Dinner Club. I really liked this book. I ended up giving it four stars just because it was what I needed. I found this copy at Goodwill. It has a lot of water damage, um, which, I don't know, I find charming. It follows these three teenage girls. They're in high school. They're struggling with their families. They all come from completely different backgrounds. They get together. They become friends. And it's kind of just like Sex in the City, but with teenage girls in New York City. And they get together once a week and they cook dinner. And I love descriptions of food. So they're baking and they're cooking and they talk about all these like delicious meals. So if you want a book that will definitely make you hungry and make you inspired to cook and just have like girl time, I recommend it. I love stories that are about female friendships. I'm just a really big sucker for it. I love it. And this is just like, it was just really wholesome. Honestly, there's really not a lot of plot other than what I just said of like teenage girls just living life, struggling with who they are, who they're interested in, relationships, family, but then coming together just to cook and communicate over food and how food is just such a bonding element between relationships and conversations. It was just fun, really. Yeah, there's no like, wild thing that happens. There's nothing crazy big that happens. There's no major disturbance in the plot. Um, and I needed that. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. I really, yeah. I tried to look up a, more about this author. Literally couldn't find anything. Could not find anything about this author, which really blew my mind. Couldn't find any photos of them. Couldn't figure out, like, did they write anything else? Nope, nothing. I could not find anything. So if you ever read this, I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, girls dinner club. These last few, man, we still got two five stars to talk about. Ooh, ooh, here we go. The next book that I read and absolutely loved was Einstein's Dreams by Alan Lightman. Oh my gosh. This is the first book that I've tabbed since like 
university probably. This one was just full of like really existential and lovely writing that just really makes you think about your own life and time. I really love writing like this so much and books that talk about like metaphysical, magical realism, but a lot of like science behind it. So I'll Let's actually just talk about the plot. Okay, here we go. Alan Lightman, I found out halfway through reading this that he's actually a physicist, um, which I thought was awesome. So in this book, Einstein's Dreams, it follows Albert Einstein as he's working in a patent office in Switzerland before he comes up with his theory of relativity and is working on it. So when he goes to sleep, he has these dreams of worlds and realms where time moves differently. So somewhere time is cyclical, everything that's happened has already happened and will continue to happen. Everything, everything that's ever happened, it'll just keep happening. Um, there's some where time moves incredibly slowly. There's some where each town has a different like time zone almost, where time moves really fast. This book really is just filled with all of these little vignettes, little chapters. It's a really small book of where time just moves differently and how it affects people in that world. It just had really interesting topics. I love that it was still a novel. It really doesn't follow Einstein as a character. There really isn't a narrative in this book and I think that's one of the reasons why I really liked it. I really enjoyed this one. Five stars. I highly recommend this one. I am so 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 excited to talk to you all about this next book because I was geeking out about it to a lot of people in real life and no one had ever heard of this book. Um, even on Goodreads there's such a low amount of readers and I was completely blown away because of the history of this book. Fun story, I actually went into my local indie bookstore to find a copy of it. I searched and I searched and I finally admitted defeat, went up to the information desk and was like, hey, do you have this book? And they looked it up and they were like, well, um, in the entire history of this local indie store being open, which I believe it's been open since like the 70s, I could be wrong, I hope I'm not super off, and there are multiple locations around, you know, my state that I live in, and they said in the entire history of this local indie bookstore being there, they have never had this book. They've never had a copy, it's never been ordered, it's never been requested, no one has ever- and I- what? Like, what the f- I had no clue. I had no idea. I really thought maybe I was just personally in the dark about this book and then I got to talking with the clerk person and they were like, I am gonna order a copy for the store, I'm gonna order a copy for you, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. So let me actually tell you what the book is. Carmilla by Joseph Sheridan Lefanu. Oh my gosh. Okay, let me tell you about the history of this book. It is a sapphic vampire story, so it's a horror, written 26 years before Dracula by Bram Stoker. Yes, you heard that right. This book influenced Bram Stoker to write frickin' Dracula. And what blew up in pop culture? Dracula, but not the sapphic lesbian book. Hmm, I wonder why. I loved this book. I loved this book. I love the history. I love the story. And it was originally published in 1871. This copy is really wonderful because it is edited by Carmen Maria Machado. I do have to say, if you get this copy in particular, don't read the introduction first because it literally spoils the entire book. I mean, you can probably assume what's going to happen in it because it's a vampire tale and uh, Dracula was influenced by it, but don't read the introduction because I thought I'd get some historical context, but really instead what I got was yeah, just some frustrating things. This copy also has some really gorgeous illustrations. How, <laughs> how steamy is that? Like, yes. Why have I not heard of this? Why have lots of us never heard of this? I think it's because... Hey friends, it's editing August. Um, <laughs> I did such a shit job of explaining why people find Carmilla to be offensive or disrespectful, and I really did not put it very eloquently, so I'm gonna try again to get this in a concise, eloquent way, but please check out Sapphic Underground's video because they did it the absolute best. Like, basically what their opinion is is so similar to mine, and it was really nice to be validated, so 
if you want to know my actual thoughts, like, please look down below. But anyway, it wasn't discovered until the 1970s in Lafanu's office that this story is actually based on real people. Um, and it was these letters that were found in the walls of his office, super fascinating, that detailed this lesbian sapphic relationship going on between two women. And that relationship inspired these characters. He didn't use any of their names. He obviously made one of the characters a vampire. So some people find that offensive because it wasn't his story to tell, which I totally agree. Like, yeah, don't plagiarize people's lives without permission. We, we should know that. But at the same time, I think that I personally am so grateful that this entered the world. This shows to me that authors and artists like Le Fanu wanted to talk about same-sex relationships in the late 1800s. That's a topic that even today you can be killed for. That's a topic that you can still be put in jail for. He brought it to light in this way where it still had a lot of creative licensing. Um, was it shitty of him to do? Absolutely. But am I happy he did? Honestly, yes, because otherwise the story wouldn't have been brought to light. This was one of the earliest books that featured same-sex relationships, and even The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, for example, was first published in 1890. This was published in 1871, so a full 21 years before The Picture of Dorian Gray is published. And I, I just think that that should account for something. Am I a historian? No. Am I extremely educated in this field? Absolutely not. This book is so important and I think we should be talking about it a lot more. Everyone I've talked to has never heard of this book before and I think it needs to be introduced. I think it's something that we should be talking about more. I think it's a book that we all need to be forming more opinions on because it's actually really hard to find a lot of information about this book. Even the introduction of this doesn't share if this book is offensive or how people interpreted it when it was originally published. While there are some parts in this book that, you know, don't outright say or explicitly say that there is some sexual intercourse happening, it's definitely alluding to it, but then there's also very physically affectionate things going on between these two characters where they're openly kissing and touching each other, and it's not hidden that this is a sapphic relationship. So, Again, I just, I really think this book is important to learn about. It definitely puts something out into the atmosphere of history, and I think we should be talking about it a lot more. But again, I'm not an expert, but just the fact that this came over 20 years before Dracula and then over 20 years before The Picture of Dorian Gray. Like, we should definitely be talking about everything that this book is um, and at least having a conversation about it, whether you agree with me or you don't. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Another issue that some people can take to it is that this book can also be interpreted as having sapphic relationships or being a lesbian is similar to being a paranormal, like, monster, like a vampire. And the vampirism or lesbianism can be spread through sucking blood or having sex or, you know, doing sinning actions, whatever. Um, and while, yes, that can absolutely be an interpretation of it, I didn't see that in this book at all. I honestly saw a caring relationship where the main character, Laura, has these feelings for Carmilla, the character. Uh, I just also realized I never told you all the plot. The main character is Laura, written from her perspective. I did not do a good job. I was so excited to tell you all about this book, and then I bombed it. Um, she obviously had feelings for Carmilla, and even after, you know, things happen, like, there's still this romantic relationship between them, and Lafanu does not shy away from talking about them kissing and making their affections pretty public, and no one discriminates against them. Laura doesn't have any internal fears of this relationship. She doesn't feel like it's wrong. Her family never says anything about it. It's never talked about. And I honestly felt like this relationship was loving even until the end, even until, you know, things happened. So that is just my thought on it. Again, please go check out Sapphic Underground's video where they talk a little bit more in depth about how this book can be interpreted as offensive. And again, it's all interpretation. We don't know what <laughs> Le Fanu's true intentions were. I don't want to recommend literature if it's truly horribly offensive to people. Like, that's 
that's awful. Um, but yeah, even this introduction didn't talk about it being offensive or talk about like why it didn't get as popular as Dracula, but my assumption is is that it's because it includes a sapphic relationship. So hopefully I did it a little bit better this time around of explaining it because just trying to edit and cut whatever the hell I was saying was really difficult. Um, so yeah, that is that. Take it away past August. So if you want a gothic, Victorian, moody horror that features sapphic vampires, read Carmilla. I, I can't believe I've gone this long without knowing it. I, I totally understand why people will criticize this book or not like it, but I thoroughly enjoyed this one. The writing is not that great. It's not anything like, oh my gosh, I think the history and the context of this book really made the experience fantastic. So five stars. I think this is definitely my favorite book that I read in the month of February. So that is Carmilla. Oh, okay, friends, this is the last book of February. And that is Kira Kira by Cynthia Katohata. This is a book that I read way back in the day, I believe kind of around the time that it came out. So like 2004, 2005. And I found this copy at Goodwill and was like, yeah, I'll, I'll reread it. It wasn't a favorite of mine of childhood, but it's one that I remembered very vividly. And yeah, this book definitely stood the test of time. I think this is an incredibly important book. It takes place in the 1950s and follows this Japanese American family and the two young daughters, Katie and Lynn. And it's all written from Katie's perspective. She is the younger sibling and she just looks up to and admires her older sister Lynn so much. And it talks about their struggles of being accepted in society and the racism and the discrimination they face, but it's through a young child's eyes. So it's not really this big deal. It feels normal and uh, smaller issues are more of a big deal for her. But this book talks a lot about grief and loss in such a profound way, especially through a small child's eyes. But throughout this book, you're able to grow along with Katie as she gets older and becomes aware of the space that surrounds her, aware of the world around her um, in that age, that really specific age where you realize that there are other things going on outside of you. And this book just does a really wonderful job. I think it's a really important book. I think it should still definitely be recommended to young readers. This is YA. I don't say I thoroughly like enjoyed this book. I do think it's important though. I think it, it's, it's not a happy book. It's not a particularly fun book, but again, it's very important. I ended up not giving this book a rating on Goodreads or just a rating in general because while it's not an enjoyable book, it's not one of my favorites from childhood. Again, I think it's important. I think a lot of young adult readers should definitely still read it. It stood the test of time, most definitely. And it talks about some really heavy human real life topics. But yeah, that is Kira Kira. So holy moly, my friends, these are the 12 books that I read in the month of February. Overall, a really successful reading month and successful month in terms of new style and new corner and cool things happening. So thank you so much for being here. What was your favorite read of February? Let me know down below. I love seeing your recommendations and comments of what you're all reading. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoy these videos. Thank you for just coming along and chatting about some awesome books. Hopefully you got some recommendations. Let me know if any of these sounded really good to you and if you think you're gonna pick up a copy or something because I would love to hear if this inspired you to read a certain type of book or a certain specific piece of literature. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here with me. I hope you all have a wonderful day. I hope you all had a wonderful February and cheers to March being fantastic as well. Stay cozy, my friends. Bye.